Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Hop on in, hop on in. Good to see the faces coming in. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Glad to see some familiar faces in the house. Good morning, good morning. Hope everybody slept good. Hope everybody had a good day. Hope everybody ain't catching no cold with this doggone weather switching up like that. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, y'all. Drop them sons in the comment. Drop them sons in the comment. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad to see some faces in here. I'm about to get it going in a little bit. What's up, Cortland? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Carla, I can't wait to use that uh that little snippet you had dropped on uh on Instagram the other day. I got some ideas with that. Alright. Good morning everybody. Hope everybody slept well. Hope everybody uh had a good night's rest and adjusted to this weather. Like y'all, this weather is weather is something else. Which I know how we do before we get started. Let's start our morning um affirmations. So I'll start the phrase and you guys end it. So whatever you need for the day, if I say I am on your end, if you need strength today, you say you're strong. If you need money today, you say I'm walking in abundance. If you need healing today, say I am healed from being sick. So I am. I will be. I am. I will be. And I receive. What's going on, guys? Good morning. Good morning. And if y'all see me playing with my, not my nose, but right here, I'm not, I'm not, there's not snot or nothing like that because I don't want people to think I'm nasty. I don't want y'all to think I'm nasty. But my, I haven't had a haircut in a minute. It's been a minute. And I told myself I'm not cutting my hair till January. I'm trying to hold out till January just because my beard and my hair is finally growing how I needed to. But this mustache hair is so curly and it keep tickling my nose and I keep thinking I got something right there. But anyways, good, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Shout out to everybody that's in here this morning. If you haven't, um, put the little sun emoji in the comment section so we could um, start the morning off nice and bright. I hope everybody's having a great day. You know, Monday was a little, Monday was different. You know, I, I got a, I picked up on a lot of depressive and not supportive energy on Monday, you know, when I went live. So the things I wanted to talk about, I did, but I want to make sure everybody understood that, you know, we got to get through what's called this seasonal depression, you know, because you have when cold weather starts to come around. And things start changing, you know, like the cold season is typically the most um, exhausting season for a lot of people in society because a lot of um, expensive holidays are around, you know, and a lot of family time that requires a lot of money is around. Well, it doesn't require it, but that's what the norm is, what people have made. Good morning, mama. She said, did you die? It's just the light. No, I didn't dye my hair yet. Um, Yeah, it's definitely just the light. I can, I don't know. I don't know why I was doing that. But um, I want to actually, I never, I don't think I told you. Hey, daddy. I don't know if I uh, if I ever told you I want to dye it red, but like not like a, not like a crazy out there red, but just like a I guess red undertones I guess you would say or like it would be, like it it's like it's it's hell red but it's red if that makes sense I don't know, but um but yeah like you know seasonal depression and stuff like that but that that was yesterday today I'm not really feeling like that today today I'm feeling more so of um she said nigga why not you don't like that good morning Cree you don't like that what what color okay what color you feel like I should um. I should at least try or attempt, but uh, and it's probably just the way my hair is too. I mean, when I when I'm gonna put it down, I'm actually I'm actually taking these braids out today. I need to. Um, what was I about to say? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So today I feel I woke up kind of kind. Well, first of all, I woke up late because it was so cold. And whenever it gets cold in my house, I just sleep late for what she said. Black. So basically, she telling me not to dye my hair. Um, I bet be- whenever whenever it's cold in my house, it's like I basically wake up and. I wake up, I tend to wake up late because it's just, I don't know why it's real comfortable, but I kind of want to have a part two with the depressional stuff that I talked about yesterday. But today I feel as though people need to hear, or at least we need to talk about, you know, the, you have these types of people that don't know how to, excuse me, they don't know how to just receive things. You know, like I'm, I will say I'm one of those type of people. It's like, I don't like being given things. Good morning, Jess. Um, I don't, I don't like 
I don't I don't know how to put it without sounding crazy. It's just like I I would rather work for it and I'd rather earn it. And I've learned that as noble and as dope as that is, you know, it's a it's a flaw because you miss out on so much and like I like we were talking about a few days ago, how I say favor ain't fair and abundance is something that you really can't control. When it happens, it happens, you have to receive it, right? You know, so I can't I can't be denying because I feel like we go through tests before we get the bigger things, right? You know, God will send somebody be like, oh, I was thinking about you. Here's like five dollars or like here's a little gift or here's a little something like that. Or, you know, you need help with groceries or this, that and the third. And, you know, your your mentality is stop that. Oh, no, I'm good. You know, I'm working. I'll get through it. I'm believing in God, blah, blah, blah. Not realizing that, you know, you just need to learn how to receive things like there's a uh, I don't know if you guys ever seen the movie The Pursuit of Happiness, one of my favorite movies. And and not because it's just Will and, and Jaden, but like I love the I just love the underdog type movies, you know, and like I love the fact that they traversed through it all and got through it. But there's a part in the movie where young Jaden, he was talking to uh, Will that was walking down the street and he was saying, um, hey, dad, you want to hear a story? He was like, yeah, he was like, OK, there was a man in the ocean and uh, he's like, and the dude in the boat came around. And he was like, hey, you need some help. You're in the middle of the ocean. You're going to drown soon. He was like, nah, don't worry. God will save me. And he was like, all right, cool. And he had some more people came around and one time, hey, man, you drowning. Like, you just floating in the middle of the ocean. How you going to get where you need to go? Like, you need some help? Oh, no, God will save me. And he was like, all right, cool. And then they had like this, like this big yacht full of people and seals and all that. Everybody was like, oh, we need, oh, man, overboard. He's like, no, don't save me. I'm going to do nothing. No, I'm good. God will save me. So eventually the man drowned and he gets to heaven and then God's like, uh no you know he's like god why didn't you save me i told i told everybody you uh you know i needed to be uh i wasn't i didn't need to be saved because you was gonna blah 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 he was like dummy i sent like three four different types of help for you you know i sent you everything that you could possibly need to get up out the water and dude's like oh you know so and it may seem kind of kind of weird to use that analogy this morning but i feel like that ties into like you know like we so we we get so fixated on how we are meant to receive things or how we are meant to really be quote unquote blessed and stuff like that. But you got to be mindful that how they say that your thoughts, not his thoughts, your ways, not his ways, you know? So whenever things come to help, whenever things come to balance you out or to what's going on Tyrone or to get you where you need to be or to just boost you. And you never know. It's like, you know, you, you accepting those, even though you might not even need it, but like you accepting that help with groceries, you know, somebody randomly paying for your dinner and stuff like that. That's just little things. God's seen if like, okay, well, you gonna accept this without being disgruntled, you know, like are you gonna actually be able to receive it? And then you get used to it while not necessarily changing your character, you know, still working and trying to achieve and earn. But then that's when they say favor ain't fair. The favor starts kicking in a little bit more, the abundance starts kicking in a little bit more. And now you're in a place to where you start getting all these random blessings out of nowhere. Everything that you think about that you need and or want, it just start happening. Even though you're in the position and you you've already started the momentum that you need to work on it and do it, you know, it already happens. So people need to really, and when I say people, I'm talking about me too. People need to really be more open to, cause, and I understand, you know, it's like, I was watching, um, what's his name? King something. I forgot. It's the Venus and Serena documentary about, uh, their dad basically. And how they got to where they are not me. Amber and I watched that a few days ago. And, um, he was, how can I put it? He was one of them type of people to where it's like, you know, he's, he's very fixated on how things, you know, are going to go and just bullheaded. I'm talking about like stuff don't change, stuff don't move. And well, without his, without his decision, you know, and it got to the point to where Venus was about to sign. Without, I don't want to spoil it for nobody, but I'm just saying the essentials and, and dip on out that topic. But like um, Venus was about to sign her first big um, contract. It was with Nike. It was before her first professional debut uh, match she did. And it was about one, what it was, I think it was like one or three million or something like that. And then, you know, they turned it down as that in the third. Now, granted, at this part of the movie, she was making her making her own decisions. But that just goes to show how it was up to that point. It, nothing was being signed. Nothing Like he wouldn't even he wouldn't even discuss stuff with his wife. You know, and it's like he had put so much attention into Venus, you know, and yeah, he was putting some stuff into Serena, but uh, Serena had to get trained and assisted by her mom. And then her mom had to step in and her mom was her because like Venus, Venus stuck out more. Venus had more. Well, it, the movie portrayed this to be like Venus had more competitive talent at the time, was better developed and her technique was better. You know, so 
she's going to junior, she's going to this and that, she's doing all the preliminaries and stuff like that. And Serena wasn't getting that type of attention. You know, then they, they dove into her envy. They dove into like how she like, I'm happy for my sister, but I'm working just as hard. I want to participate. I want to do this, that, and the third, you know, and the dude like or the father, you know, he was eventually they started putting more time into Serena, but like, I mean, Venus was the scapegoat at the time. So it wasn't until he really let go of how stubborn he was in his ways because, oh, it ain't a part of playing and blah, 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 blah. It wasn't until he really gave, you know, things, not say giving it away, but like really letting things just flow because you work so hard to do and get what you want and push your kids and push yourself and survive. And it's that in the third coming from poverty. And before she even played her first professional match, they was already living pretty decently, you know, but I, and I ain't going to spoil the movie because y'all going, y'all, if when y'all go watch it, y'all going to see, but, um, when he really let things go and he was like, okay, well she can make her own decisions. I receive, you know, like really trying to be open to whatever was supposed to be next. You know, she went and played the match. I ain't going to say what happened. And then, you know, the contract people when Nike came back after the match, even though came back after the match and then, you know, they presented her an even bigger number, you know? So, and I say, all that to say is like, you have to get out your own way. Sometimes you really do, because it's a lot of things that we want, in life and there's a lot of things that we're aspiring for and we have this like especially people that come from not having money you know or not being the riches or just being so goal driven we tend to be visionaries we tend to be people that know how to look at things work for something and we know what we want we know what the end looks like for us or what we want it to look like and it's rare that we're we're so locked in but we also can hop out of the tunnel vision mode oh kimmy i didn't even know kimmy's up here kimmy um, we hop out the tunnel vision mode and then we get we get a chance to receive all the other things that's supposed to push us forward. You know, hey, Jory, my dad said God will use people to bless you is blurry to operate through people and things. Yeah. And prime example, like it's like it's like people. How can I put it? It's like people building houses. Right. It's like you can you can be building a house. You got you got the know how, you know, you've been saving up your money. You know, you took out whatever loan you, t- you needed. You know, you're about to build your first rental property. You got things going. And, you know, you have enough to do this, that, and the third. And you focus and you're really trying to do it. But you got people coming in. Oh, man, I know a great electrician electrician that can come and help you with what's going on, booby. Uh, a great electrician that can come and help with this, that. I, I know some carpenters that can help you with this, that, and the third. Now nah, I got it. I got it. Thank you, though. You know, and like you're for real about it, but not realizing that's helping to speed up the process. That's people who are a little bit more articulated in their area than you are. Not to say you'll do a bad job, but, you know, it'd be the little things, you know, it'd be the little things that can really take your product or your destiny from decent and make it real great. You know, when you allow things to come in and be a blessing to you, because it's not that it's not that that's what people need to work, need to need to realize It's not that we're not working hard enough. It's not that we're not strategizing enough and it's not that we aren't taking the time to learn about what we're doing granted there's a a lot of things we don't know that's really would take our finances and ability to the next level but we'll get there as a society but you know it's being open it's being open and and, but it's hard it's hard it's really hard especially for black people it's really hard to trust external things when it comes down to random blessings because you know, it's hard to take things for free because everything that even back from slavery, they give us something or they give us something for free. It always comes with a price or it's taken away. It's easily taken away from us. So I get it. You know, it's, it's people like to talk about the crab in the barrel mentality, but nobody ever talks about why the crabs are in the barrel because crabs are not supposed to survive or, or they don't even know how to be in habitat inside of a, inside of a barrel. You know, but nobody really talks about the barrel. Everybody was talking about how the crab is putting other crab do- down, but they're not talking about the barrel, which. You know, we'll talk about it, which brings me to a, a controversy that's been going on since the 1920s. So there's a there's a controversy I started. Um, My friend Chris Jones had posted the podcast yesterday and I started diving into it, been diving into it since yesterday. And what I've learned so far is like apparently there's been a uh controversy since like the early 1920s, even up until now. And even though a lot of you people already know this, but, you know, just, I'll just explain the, the operation that's been going on. It's not that it's not that we have. It's not that black people have um, lower literature rates and, you know, they're more special needs and stuff like that. It's the fact that the system that we're in is isn't designed to understand our black children. They say it was like 70 to 75 percent or majority. Yeah, 70 to 75 percent of uh, African-American children are in special needs classes or stuff like that uh, of the our total popula- population. And I was like, how? So they start off the podcast like that. 
And then they said how um, it all started from, I forgot the exact tribe, but it all started from whenever they was taking our um, ancestors and everything from Africa to here. And strategically from the top, from the start of it, they would purposely take, it was no such thing as like, oh, well, these clans is coming to this plantation, is that in the third. They would purposely get as many of certain clans as they can, organize them, write them down as far as like who's what, where we got who from, who looks like what, like a real like system. And then whenever we get to where we got to go to like either sell or put them to the slave plantations, purposely, purposely splitting um, clans and stuff like that up. So if you were stolen, which, you're, OK, say my family, for instance, is me, my dad, my mom, my sister, excuse me, all on the boat. Right. And when we get to America at the time, well, where what it was considered, um, they split, they split us up. Right. So it's me and is me. And whoever else was on the boat with me that I don't even know, we go to this plantation. My mom and somebody else go on this other plantation. My dad goes over here. My sister goes over here. And it was like in the interview, it was like, well, why y'all doing that? Because these we don't know the language that they speak. But if we t- if we take those same people that we had to steal, you know, and come over here. And now all of a sudden we put a whole bunch of people in the same areas to associate work for us. They speak in languages, languages we don't understand. You know, they're doing this, that and the third that we don't understand. And. They're going to they're going to eventually get power over us and do it. We don't we can't we can't really control them. So that was one of the things that they did. Another thing that they did a little bit um, post slavery was whenever it came down to the whole controversy. And that's what kind of Ebonics came from, because they talk about how even though they was amazed that even though our ancestors were split up and stuff like that, we still developed. That's why they say no singing and songs like that. And it's like why they were working, because it was like they still figured out ways to communicate via sounds. You know, music, little thuds and stuff like that. But you can't take, you know, that's in that's in our our blood. You can't take that away from us. You know, we're gonna find a way to get through it. But we fast forward a little bit more into the future, not necessarily the current present day, but a few years, about a few decades moving forward, right? A little post post slavery, well, post slavery because we still in slavery right now. But I ain't gonna dive into that. Um, you know, so we we're having like segregation and stuff like that, and then. We're going into kids um, that they're, they're trying to build certain type of schools and put kids in schools and, you know, the red line and all that type of stuff. Certain kids have to go to this school and certain kids have to go to this school. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind, English, as opposed to the white people that was already here and stuff like that, they have their own form of, of English. Right. And as African-Americans now, we have a very broken style of English. And it's not that it's dumb. It's not because like people like to say, these, especially these days, it's still it's still trying to be washed out. And we got to stop doing that slang. I was slang. I would I would the way we talk. I was sauce or whatever you want to call it. They water it down and they say, oh, it's ghetto. And is that in the third? But it's Ebonics. And they coined it Ebonics. We didn't coin that. They coined that stuff. Um, Ebonics is really one of one of the most beautiful literature survival skills that we've adapted from back then to now. And it's still prospering, you know, because the whole reason why speech pathology for black people even started was because they want to understand it. But the downside, which made the bro- our broken Ebonics these days is that they, they form those type of pathology uh, ideologies for them, for them to under, for them to make us understand what they're saying and to translate what we're saying to them and not the other way around. It's always one sided because it's control and it's power, but they would have these tests to determine how smart a child is, this, that, and the third And they would do like with little kids, they'll have like little pictures. Right. And they'll put a black child and a white child in the same room. They'll do these little literature tests and uh, IQ tests and stuff like that. So they had um, they had like this picture of like a tree and it was a squirrel. Right. And literally, literally, they would ask, they would ask ask the children, what what do you see? And one child would be like, no, no, there's like what? Like, where uh, where is the squirrel? One child was like the, the white child was like. The squirrel is in the tree. And then the black child was like in the tree. Now, same answers, right? Same exact answers. But they would deem that child retarded because he didn't say the squirrel was in the tree. Now, based off of how literature is these days and how they teach English and stuff like that, it doesn't. I understand like, oh, well, it is problematic that he's not using proper subjugation and blah, 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 blah. But. When they started breaking the, uh, they started breaking down like our la- our African language back then from now, and I just me personally, my personal feel, my personal opinion, I feel as though the way we talked and how we integrated English into our language is smarter because we don't use double plurals like they use and like what what 
what's already there doesn't need to be reiterated. So it's like they started breaking down like Ebonics and how it kind of ties into what we're saying. Like nobody, nobody really says like, um, like it's 50 is 50 cent instead of 50 cents, because we've already implied that 50 is the quantity and it's a plural form or it's a multitude of this particular item or noun. So it's like, why is it that we need to keep pluralizing all this type of stuff? Reasons why pronunciation difference between white people and black people is so different because we come from an area and we come from our, and it's just, it's habitual, even though we've been trained with like all this new English and stuff like that from since we've been out here up until now, you still see how the slangs and stuff like that are still being used in what they call like Ebonics and stuff like that now, but it's just, it's naturally how we talk and it's not, people need to stop. That's not a bad thing, you know, and it's not, Oh, it's ghetto. You don't know how to speak. No, I'm actually speaking as natively as my, my body is trying to be, you know? So, and just, and you got to realize too, it was so segregated back then. There was no integration of education for a while, you know? And then like the researchers, the, uh, the pathologist uh, researchers that would have to go into the slums and stuff like that to try to research these black children, you know, there was like a lot of these people, the, the first, it was so segregated, The first, especially in Chicago, they were talking about, there was them children first time seeing a white person, a white male at that, a white scientist, you know, so it's like, y'all can't sit there and try to make us fit in y'all system with this type of stuff, and we was never given a fair chance to begin with, you know, so they further on was talking about, um, it was like a con it's a congressional something. I forgot the name of it. I'm gonna put the I'm gonna have to find the link again. This is my phone and I'm gonna put it in here so y'all go back and watch it. But it was like a uh it was like a debate or stuff they was having, like through these pathologists, this, that, and the third. And they was talking about like modern day slang and how it how one side was like it's so broken and then the other side was like, No, it actually makes sense because now we're living in a time where um a lot of pathologists, especially white pathologists, are actually taking the time to translate on both sides rather than, oh, I'm just going to throw English down your throat and not understand how you naturally, because our brains process en uh, English and languages differently. It's not that we can't speak eloquently. It's not that we can't learn vocabulary. It's the way that we express our knowledge and our intelligence is different from white people. And that shouldn't be a problem. But they said, the scientists said this on the congressional debate. This is what they said. The reason why we even started this pathology and we coined um, Ebonics and stuff like that was because if we would have let them um, continue to sharpen their own language that they had to create to communicate with one another, this, that, and the third with the modified English or whatever, it wouldn't be fair and it would have an um, intellectual advantage over white people and we cannot control them and have power. So we've been, now think about it, those people who are making the rules and making, you know, the the, the classes and the, the curriculum and stuff like that, that's been their ideology since I'm saying the 1920s because that's what a podcast started at, but probably way before then, you know, and you got a lot of you got to have a lot of people saying like, oh, well, this is 2021. That doesn't exist. Blah, 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 blah. Stop that. Stop that. We can't we can't say there's no more prejudice and there's no more disadvantages that's purposely being placed whenever you have a system that's not even designed to support the people that will give people the proper justice. We just watched the, the cases that is going on with Rittenhouse and dude came through and murdered everybody. They did this, that, and the third and get no jail time. What's going on, Lena? And we, but then when you go back and look at the Trayvon Martin uh, case, dude's dead. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, and if they want to talk about, I mean, if y'all, if y'all really want to talk about how like fair or unfair things are, they want to talk about like how they were saying they was claiming self-defense and like he did what he did in the act of nature and blah, 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 blah. And the possession of the, uh, of a weapon and this and the third. Well, how about we go back to whenever um I forgot her name. Lord, I forgot her name. But her but her boyfriend had defended her because she was they killed in, in her sleep. I forgot her name. I'm sorry, y'all. They had killed in her sleep. And because they, they had they didn't have the warrants or nothing like that. And the, the boyfriend got up to defend the house. So technically he wasn't wrong. But y'all trying to give him jail time, you know, so it, it's like, I don't know. I just don't I just don't see. I try to keep up with these things like that, but I really don't sometimes because it, it, it makes me very frustrated. And it, and it frustrates me to the point to where it's not that I give up on the governmental system and stuff like that. But like it makes me want to do more things like this. You know, to show people another perspective of life and show people Brianna Taylor. It is Brianna Taylor. Thank you so much, Corlin. And it's not that I didn't know her name. I just can't think of it in a moment. I got a whole bunch of things in my head. But it's just the simple fact of like, you know, we in we in a we in a situation to where it's like we need different perspectives. We need different types of ideologies from our black families and cultures to where we can progress ourselves forward. There's been so much fear 
about rebuilding the black wall street there's been so much fear about us taking our economic wealth and power and translating it to this one area there's been so much fear of us traveling and going back to our motherland and stuff like that and in my in my personal opinion we need to understand the true power that we have because imagine let's just imagine for a moment every single black person in america every single one mixed 100 percent black whatever you want to call it i don't care if you got black in your family you're black right imagine and I'm talking about celebrities, influences, all of them. We all take our money. We all take our possessions. We take all of our people because Ghana's doing dual citizenship right now. We all move to Ghana. Now our America's stuck with, in matter of fact, let's take the let's take the Hispanics too. Everybody that's not white, let's just go. You know, because the system is really not for anybody that's not white. So like, let's take all of our people and just go right. And the white people are just stuck here with themselves. Now you have no more influence. Now you have no more innovation. Now, now you have no hello, Miss Turner. I mean, good morning, Mr. I don't know why I say hello. Now you now you don't have you don't have half of the, the force and the economic power that's rotating through our economy like we used to. People could say what they want to say. Black people are the are the biggest consumers of blah blah blah. This is that and the third. We last time I checked we had like a trillion dollar um we had a trillion dollar um spending spending power in America. So imagine if we all took our stuff and got up out of here. Now, with, and then it's a lot deeper than that. You know, you're taking away the flavor. You're taking away the food. You're taking away, like they like I said, the ebonics. You're taking away everything that they're trying to uh, colonize and everything that they're trying to take as their own. Like, really look at really look at social media, right? Things don't move until black people move. Notice whenever black people wasn't doing nothing, social media had stopped. When we did a whole strike, social media stopped. Literally. Everybody else was trying to do other stuff, but that's not them. That's not what they do. You know, so it's like we need to really take we need to really look at our power and look at what we hold dear to us and how we need to move. Because, I mean, in, in reality, if we take it back to reality, 80 percent of people are not going to move. About 80 percent of our people are not going to move. We're not going to put our money into strictly into the black dollar. We're not going to move how we need to move. You know, so what we need to do is start taking back our power and, and at least making decisions to move as a unit again. You know, it's like I'm one of those people who are pro, you know, do for yourself It's like make sure exactly remove the money. We remove the power, like keep like let's start putting our money back into communities because what they what they're not going to tell you is look at the Chinese people and Asian people that come here. Right. They buy they buy this one house or they buy a lo- whatever money they got to buy, whatever house they got. Everybody lives in there. the grandmother, the cousins, the this, that and the third. They everybody living all in the same house just for the time being, because we understand the mission. We all moving in. We crowd into this house, but we gonna make it work. Okay, we everybody gets jobs. We saving money. We stacking money because we got a goal, right? Okay, we gonna form an auto shop. We gonna form a nail shop. We are gonna form some type of stuff. So now we putting all the money that everybody's coming in. It's accumulating. We putting it all towards this business. Now it's a family business. Okay, everybody quit your jobs. Now we work in a family business. So now they have a circulation of money coming in via their family and their ideas, right? So now they they're circulating their dollar in their family in their nationality. So now. Their spending power just went up. Their worth just went up. Their resources just went up. You know, so now imagine us doing that as black people. We come together. We start these businesses. We do this, that, and the third. Like, just like they have. And I agree with I saw it on social media. It was like um, baby showers and all that stuff is cool, right? But what about business showers? What about family business showers? What about supporting showers? You know, like, so we really come to. And the people like to say, well, it be us. It be us that don't support this, that, and the third. And you know how we do. Like, yeah, you got some people that just, they're not looking they not they not looking to really do it the right way because it's like well what is, what it is for me and y'all gotta understand that comes from a very broken ideology of like like people think that this stuff is now this stuff is really slim from slavery like we we're not that far from when slavery ended because I, I still feel like we ended but you know it's like we need to understand that whenever we truly come together and like get the ones that want to work get the ones that actually believe in the vision get the ones that actually want to start a power structure you know and then like we do that and I'm not saying we're not going to have adversity because look at Black Wall Street, you know, but at the same time, look at where we are now. We're in a different type of economy. You got a lot more, a lot of young entrepreneurs, you know, and like they actually um, community over individualism. Perfect. That That is perfect. I should use that for uh, the title of this. this. That's perfect. But you got people who are, prim- you know what? Prime example. Um, Cortland and I have been making music together and working in the music business since oh lord 2000 and i met Cortland in 2014 so i want to say i want to say we really started playing together about two three years after that now now we've been 
uh, around people that knew music, this, that, and the third. And, you know, we cultivated bands and we did this, that, and the third. Now, imagine if, imagine if Corlin and I had the, I wish we had the knowledge back then like we have now, but everything happens for a reason. But um, imagine if Corlin and I started um, on campus a, a black innovative business, music business. All the black students that are coming in for, because uh, we both went to UL, all the black students that's coming in to learn about music and music, music business, not only will we help you with your courses, but we're going to form bands within and, and music groups and music business groups within those people that are trying to learn. Because nothing, so I don't care what nobody say, nobody's hungrier than uh, somebody that came to school for music and you actually could be there. You don't really have to work too much. You know, like you really there on scholarships or loans or whatever. And you got people around you that want to do the same thing that's on the same path as you. And you put those people together. Because I feel like that's the real reason why we grew. It was me, Sean, Kevin, Cortland, Justice, Chris, uh, Kiana. Um, oh, I see her face, but I can't remember her name right now. Um, forgot her name. I'm sorry. But, like, uh, our crew. You know, our, our crew at the time. And, like, we were the we were the golden students at UL in music because it was like, you know, we was always together. We was all in the same jazz combos. We was always creating something outside of the uh, the curriculum. We was always eating together. You know, like it was a real life community. And like, imagine if we would have cultivated all the little young black kids, Sarah, that's her name, all the young black kids that came in, you know, via UL for like music and stuff like that. Okay, we're going to show you guys how to understand this music from another perspective. We're going to show you guys how to play certain music from a different perspective. We're going to show you all how to gig. Actually, we have this band, and now all you guys are going to be a part of it. So now we're going to take it to the community. Hey, we have this type of band as fueled by young UL students and blah, 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 because while you're in school, you might as well use the name. You know, yeah, I'm a representation of UL uh, Jazz Studies curriculum or the music business curriculum, blah, 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 blah. And now we have this big compilation of just a whole bunch of black students doing this and we're bringing in money, right? So like say me and Corlin are the heads of everything. We take the money, we reimburse it for everybody that needs to do whatever, but we're also putting it into like legal organizations, advertisement, all this other type of stuff, right? So now within the next, what, five, 10 years later, we have a musical financial empire. You know, so it's, it's that is that simple. But they take away our knowledge. They try to take away our influence. They try to take away our motivation. They try to take away all this type of stuff that we need. And they like to deem it as dumb. They like to deem it as retarded. They like to deem it as ghetto. This, that, and the third. But it's beauty in everything. It's like, I, I get it, y'all. Like, we come from either the hoods, the slums, wherever. We're not middle class. I don't care. If you're black, you're black. We all have this thing in common where we understand quote unquote ebonics we under we understand how things move we understand how things work you know and that's just how we move as a unit like you don't have to tell another black person how to be a black person when we all come together we have this thing to where we just understand well most of us well we just understand you know and if we start moving as a collective unit and start putting things where they need to go imagine the power we would have back again and it's get it's somewhat getting there because i feel like you know somebody like me from little new iberia louisiana you know, it's, it's like I have these these visions and these ideas and stuff like that. And not to demean my talent or anything or to belittle it. But what I'm saying is like, you know, you got you imagine people that grow up in city cities. You know, they're around different types of environments, different types of stimulants. And there's a way bigger population. So imagine if they was to start it. You know what I'm saying? Like it grows faster because there's more people. There's there's a rate. The ratio is just big, bigger and better. But, you know, what's for us is going to be for us. And I still like to say, like, don't let them people say, oh, well, you're stupid because you don't understand the ebonics. Well, your ebonics doesn't make sense with the English that we're doing and you're stupid and blah, blah, blah. Don't let them people talk to your your children like that. Because and going back to the uh, the podcast about the ebonics controversy, because they, they, it got to a point to where some uh, pathologists want to see how true are these ideologies that we're studying? How true is this? These these laws and principles you guys putting up. So what they did was they started um, changing the languages of the test. So like. A, a black teacher would re- originate the standardized test or a, excuse me, or a Hispanic person would, you know, like whatever your ethnicity is, they would they would reword it for that. Scores and IQs was flying up by the 20s, like placements was flying up and flying up. So it's like it's not it's not that kids are stupid. Kids are just kids and we're human and we're different. How about we just respect the fact that we are different and try to translate on both ends right? be like, well, this is the one way. This is the one language. This is how we do this, that, and the third. Because if that was if that was the truth, if this one language was so superior to this, that, and the third, you got people in Spain speaking a whole nother language. And I'm talking about better soccer players than than, I, than we are. You know, they have some of the best scientists out there. Their culture is different, and they're thrive. They're a thriving area. You know, look at Africa. There's always thriving, but they don't speak English. They don't speak primarily English. You know, they have their all their different tones and dialects and stuff like that. So why is it that 
and I'm not saying I'm not saying all these other countries are perfect and stuff like that. But if you really when you look at how all of this stuff happened and how it's broken down, it's like if we was to if they were to focus more so on unity and understanding, we wouldn't have half the problems we have now, which is another reason why I say I don't I don't believe that we'll actually have a true utopian society ever in history, because that's just how people are. But at the same time, it's like you notice that it's all based off of, off of a power structure and a control structure. They feel as though the more um, control that they have, the more power influence that they have, or the, the more of ability that they have to uh, to curve or recreate the reality of another person is power, which is true to a certain extent. But at the same time, we have to look at the power. It's like we've been so so just torn down and beat up over the decades and the centuries and like all these ideologies that have been passed down to us as a mean of survival rather than living. You know, it's like, imagine whenever we really come together and the people that have made it out or the people that are doing better, they start passing down certain ideologies and certain factors to us that we can implement and then we use it. See, because the thing I love about you, I love and hate about YouTube is like them people much might very much so be you know successful, but YouTube is just, just another form of TV. It's entertainment at the same time because you, you never really know the person. But and it's hard to like, okay, well, do I really trust your program or not? Because at the end of the day, you do what you got to do to make money as well. But like, are you really trying to help the community? Are you really trying to show me what I need to get ten, twenty thousand dollars a month and blah, 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 blah? Because I was look, you know what humbled me? I ain't gonna say humble. You know what would woke me up a little bit more besides the talks with my parents about money? Because uh, my parents would talk to me about finances any day if I ask and be on it. But like, whenever I really started to understand that a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year really ain't nothing in the grand scheme of things. And I'm not saying well, it ain't a lot of money because if I if most of us had that right now we'd be very comfortable because we know how to live. You know we don't we know how to live without going beyond our, our our needs. I feel that. But at the same time, when you look at like real wealth. When they talk about people who are like really wealthy and rich and stuff like that, them people blow through that type of stuff in a few months. And it's not that they just they have always oh, have a because people like to focus on the lifestyle. They have such an expensive lifestyle, blah, blah, blah. No, it takes it really takes money to make money. You know, it's like I'm operating my small business on the scale that it's at now, you know, and like a lot of a majority of what I have to do has to go back into the business for promotion, for access, for this, that and the third to operate. And then the rest comes back to the house. And then also, y'all know I'm about to say I'm about to say the T word and I hate this word, but taxes. I can't stand taxes. But especially as a young business owner, I cannot stand taxes. It's Jesus Christ. But um just just like you have to understand that like whenever you really cross that threshold of like real wealth and real economic power and re and access to resources, the game completely changes. The perspectives completely change. Like you'll see a lot of rich black people and I'm not talking about the snobby ones. I'm talking about the ones that's real, you know, and they'll be like, well, you can't think about finances that way. You actually got to think about it like this. Don't move your money like this. Move it like this. And it's so it's so different from what we know and what we've been based off of survival. Because you got to think about the people that's accumulating wealth or who are the best winners at the capitalism game right now, the white people. They're not coming from a survival uh, standpoint of finances that those type of ideologies are not being passed down to their kids. It's more so here's what we have. Here's how we expand the lot that we have. Here's how you run the business. Because at the end of the day, even though kids and, you know, and like the rich people come from money and stuff like that, you have to know how to run the business to keep making money. You just have to. It's not like, oh, we've got money. The business runs itself, blah, blah. No, you got to know how to run it. But it's the fact that they're not sharing that information with anybody else because capitalism is a game. Capitalism is a power structure. Rather than having a system to where resources are evenly distributed, finances are evenly distributed because that's nothing people have to realize resources and finances is two totally different terms on when you got resources i'm talking about access to water access to electricity all this type of stuff when you talk about finance i'm talking about currency in the state of your web your geographic location you know like imagine gotta think about it we're the only species on this planet that's and we claim to be the smartest but we're the only species on the planet that pays to live you look at animals, you look at insects, you look at all this other type of stuff. They're not dropping one dollar to live. They're living off of the world and how it is. And if we're so smart, we should have taken the technolo technological advances that we've developed. And instead of charging people to drink water and charging people to have electricity, this, that, and the third and power and all of that, we should have turned that into ways to better the earth and the technology so we can flow better through our resources to where everybody can have decent finances. to Because when you really take out, think about it. Before all of this capitalism stuff happened and people were just living off the land, 
the reason why people were living so much longer, we're, li- we're happier, we're doing this, that, and the third, and everything was just good, you know, it was because, like, they didn't have to think about, okay, I got to go to work. It was more so, like, I have a farm, you know, I do this, I trade this for that. As a village, we come together and do this, and we do that. We have our days where we, you know, you don't have to wake up and worry about going to work. And, like, because we're not, if you really think about it, we're not, like I said, we're still in slavery, but our bodies are not in our mentality. God did not make us to wake up every day and punch in the clock and do this, that, and the third. Even though we've adapted to it and that's how we survive and stuff like that, like, it's so stressful. I don't care what nobody say. Like, even doing what you like, I love being a fitness coach and a musician and all that type of stuff. But I hate the fact that I have to punch in every day, you know. But, like, if we go back to back then to where it's like you're known for this, you do a good job at it, and it circulates and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like you really don't have to get on that that grinding horse of, okay, I got to make sure I got a gig. I got to make sure I do it this way. I got to blah, 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 blah. You know, back then it was like, okay, well, the minstrel comes and does this, or the fitness guy comes and does this. We trade this. This was what happened. Everybody's good. You're good for the next few months. Go live your life. Which is why we had a lot of people expanding and traveling, a lot of people building kingdoms. Like, if you notice, like, the wealth would travel. Like, oh, well, this this person started a kingdom over here. This person started a kingdom over here. The wealth and the resources have been redistributed here. We found this, and we redistributed over the land, and everybody's doing well now. Like, ending poverty, ending, like... Me personally, I feel as though we have so much real estate and we have so much food that we throw away in the world, in the U.S. alone. There should be no homeless person that's hungry. There really shouldn't. And it's like we got to stop demonizing homeless people. Them people got there for, I mean, think about you. Like you wouldn't want to be homeless right now. You don't want to be born into homelessness. But I mean, life happens. People, yeah, people make dumb decisions. People, you know, take the wrong drugs. People, you know, end up in these situations however they got there. But they're still people. I watched the interview with a guy in New York. And he was like, uh, he said, he said, I don't want to be out here with this cup panhandling every day. You know, he said, I'm a human being. He said, I want, he said, y'all don't think I want to work. He said, I, I can't afford a cell phone. This, that, and the third, you know, but like, I, I said, I don't mind. He said, I, I flip burgers. He said, I'll go flip burgers. I'll go dump trash. He said, I don't care. He said, but just because I'm homeless, they don't give me a chance. He said, I'm still a person. He said, I had some stuff happen to me that got me here. He said, but I'm still a, a working person in this society. I still want to survive and live, you know? And I feel like as black people, you know, it's like the more we come together and have more power, access to resource and access to currency, we're able to help people like that. You know, we're able to really guide. And and that's another thing, too, getting back into our holistic ways of living, like I preach about so much, is like being when I talk about me being a holistic coach, I'm not talking about just fitness. I'm talking about ways of life as well. Getting back to understanding our symbolism, getting back to understanding our colors, our culture, how we flow, how we move, how we support one another. Because, like, when you have all these imbalances in fellow black people around us, you know, you, the very person that people are looking down on that's homeless can be the next genius, can be the next inventor of this, that, and the third. But we put so much energy and time into to regular people to where it's like we miss out on what could have been. But to go back to dude, he was like, um... He's like, how y'all think? He said, people calling me a bum every day. I'm out here with this cup trying to get little quarters and stuff just to give me a cheeseburger to survive for the day, this, that, and the third. You know, thank God they got them people come and do uh, homeless haircuts and stuff like that. He said, because other than that, I'll be out here looking all crazy. You know, he said, people look at me, he said, every day I want to break down and cry and quit and just want to end it all. He said, but I know I-, I matter. He said, I know who I am to myself. You know, and it's like, you got people that really wouldn't even bat an eye on them. You know, but like I still like to say, everybody's still somebody regardless of where they've been. And that's how the government looks at and the system looks at us as black people. You know, we black, we trying to survive. We trying to make up for the lost time that we had in slavery economically and socially and just that in the third. And the government's like, you bums. Notice they like to say, oh, you, 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 your parents weren't there. You don't have a father that taught you anything. And, oh, well, you coming from the hood. What do you know? Oh, you're smart and you come from this school. What do you know? How do you blah, 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 blah. They look at us the same type of way as most people look at homeless people. But we get a few dollars or we get a few little something here and there. And we want to, you know what I'm saying? We want to move a, a different type of way rather than like, cause that's what I'm saying. It's like, I know for me personally, whenever I make it or whenever I get access to these things, it's not just about me. Like I said this weeks ago in my other podcast, it was like I really want to take the time to like really develop, redevelop like my community, really like really read uh, my words, redevelop like my family's like living and, and my family's living good. I'm not saying like nobody's homes or nothing like that. My mom and them, everybody good. But it's like, you know, but like to recreate that sense of village and society standpoint, financially, geographically, no matter how I can do it, you know, it may be a difference, you know, but like it's it's just so it's hard. But at the same time, it's like. It really happens when we all come together because I I think about it this way. And this is just me. I I, I know what I'm about to say may may sound crazy, but y'all hear me out. 
I don't feel as though basketball players, I don't feel like athletes in general should be getting paid more than teachers. I don't. I feel like the teachers should be the millionaires. I feel like the community investors, you know, well, not investors, but the people that, that help with, like, homelessness and all that type of stuff, they should be the millionaires because it's like, yeah, you know, you train, you got skills and talents to go dunk a ball, throw a football, get net. I get that, and that's and that's a lot of our ways out of the – I'm not even going to dive into that because if I start talking, talking about that, I got to talk about economic slavery with, with athletes. We're not going to talk about that, but I will dive into this. Whenever you take, whenever you take the, the, the spotlight – off of certain things that's shiny and like, oh, this is how, this is lucrative. This is how you make the most money, and you put it at what? Imagine, imagine, we have let's use New Iberia for example, because we have a lot of black people out here, a lot of black students. Imagine if the black, t- well, I'm not gonna say black people, but the teachers, the teachers that care. Imagine if the teachers that care were averaging two to three hundred thousand dollars a year. They still get their summers off. They still get their weekends off. You know, they still have access to the resources that they need to do this, that, and the third. Imagine how much better. And they actually put money. That's nothing to stop designing these schools like prisons. I'm not even going to go into that. Anyways, but I wish Andre was here because me and him talk about this stuff. We be talking about this a lot. Like, we really don't like how the school system is set up when it comes out to pay. And it's just, it's horrible. But imagine if those people were being paid handsomely. And now you got teachers that's more, even more motivated to go to work, have the resources to help. Like I got, I mean, my mom been in the school system as long as I can remember, you know, and I can, I can only, I can't even tell you the amount of times my mom came to school and was talking about, Hey jazz. Um, I didn't even know you was up in here. Uh, jazz text me back. I texted you yesterday about something. You may have changed your number, but just text me so I can make sure I have the right number. I need to talk to you about something. But, um, also I want you on the show too. You and Cortland, but I can't, I can't tell you the amount of times my mom came back home and was talking about wishing what she can't. What's going on, Bree? Good morning. Wishing about talking about what she wish she could do for the students and helping out this and doing that because my mom has a big heart for kids, for students and especially special needs students, you know. And it's like, and I'm sitting there in the back of my head, like, well, if they paid teachers the right way, because you got to think about it, who you gonna pay more? The people that's going out here dunking balls and shooting threes and all this type of stuff, or the people that's literally in charge of the next generation of humans? Because like a lot of ideologies, a lot of practices and behavior concepts that's moving forward into where are really generated from a lot of our teachers, you know, uh, she said, I mean, to, I meant to call you out. I'll take, okay, cool. So I do have the right number. I'm just making sure, um, it's generated through teachers. So it's like, if our teachers are in, you gotta think about, it, you got teachers that's coming to school that's just really don't want to be there, but it's a decent, um, it's a decent enough amount of money to keep them there. You know, they don't really care about the students. That's another thing too. Put more evaluation into these teachers. Like people like my mama, if they were to do like a lot better with like student teacher evaluation and how they feel and this, that, and the third, and let that be predicated upon how much you get paid and how things move and how the money goes into the school, schools would be, but it would be, it would be, it would be so crazy, you know? And like my dad saying, he said, the pay goes according to the interest of the people um people say that they are about education but it's about the entertainment and it's saying see Mark, i can't click it his way over there but i agree with what he's saying because it's like you take the interest off of the sports and the flashy things and then you put it on actual teachers and stuff like that the people that's in charge of the next generation because you gotta think about our upbringing like one of the things i even though i don't like school at all the things that i remember the most about would turn me into a better person would help me throughout life and like the friends i made and stuff like that was the classes i was in you know like my interest in certain languages and certain interests was based off of the teachers that i had like a lot of my teachers exposed me to like anime to spanish to japanese to music like shout out to kennel and uh his his dad passed recently i, I pray y'all y'all get through it. i really i'm sending a whole bunch of love y'all way but kennel was one of the main reasons why i really started and i never took a lesson with oh i never took like a schedule lesson with, with kennel but every time I was with Kendall, he taught, he was teaching me things on the piano, teaching me how to read certain music a certain type of way, how to express certain interval music intervals. Shout out to Andre. Like I told you a few days ago, Andre was, um, even though he's a teacher, he wasn't a teacher back then, but he's a teacher now. Showed me how to look at music a different way. Showed me how to look at life a different way. You know, how to look at my, my black self a different way. You know, like mama, I was watching my mom be a teacher, how the love that she had for her students, you know, how to love, like how to understand because my mom was in sped. And I never had a prejudice or anything towards special needs kids, but it's like I I wasn't around them enough to understand them. But she was at the time and watching how she talked about them, how she would say, well, if you give this one this more time like this, this person can start talking like this and blah, 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 like a science, a surgeon with it. You know, and it's like that changed my perspective on so many things, watching her sacrifice and go with the dance team and like really getting them girls involved. You know, it's like, why are these not the millionaires of our society? 
Why are these not the glorified, deified people of our society? And they are in charge. Shout out to my girlfriend, Amber. Like now she's over the industrial arts area and she does an amazing job, you know, and she's freaking out her, her walk and stuff like that because it's new to her. But like I'm watching her like just mentally just grow so quickly and how to deal with kids and like, you know, the stuff that goes on in the classroom and how she feels about this, that and the third. And I love that they have. I'm thankful that they have her as a teacher because her ideology on life in general, or, and that's another thing too. People got to realize that how teachers view life and how they view the real world determines how those, because a lot of kids will have a lot of personal conversation with their teachers that they wouldn't have with their parents. If we're going to be honest about that, you know, and it's like when you have the right teachers in the right places saying the right things and doing the right things towards these children, imagine a quote unquote problem child who just really don't know how to express themselves or really don't have a way to express themselves, gets a hold of a teacher in a certain classroom that hears them out, that gives them extra time, that does this and does that and really, you know, move things, move things forward for them. Like imagine how, you know what I'm saying? And imagine that teacher is getting paid handsomely to enjoy their job even more. Cause you got to think about how much you got to really love children and really love the educational system and the betterment of the of the area and the kids and stuff like that to get paid so little you know because the average sub and regular teachers getting paid a lot to get paid that little and still show up with as much love and understanding as you can for these kids that's coming from hoods that broken families and like violence and all this other type of stuff like come on man like we not we not looking at life the real way we really not what's going on Keisha? Um, and we're not we're not looking at life how we need to. But when we actually start diving into this educational system and we start diving into like our, and changing our point of views on who's the real social media influences, who's the real important, important people in this world, in this society. And we start giving those people the proper attention is that in the third, everything will change, will start changing. You know, the power structures will change. Everything will start changing. But until then, we stuck with what we got. Well, I ain't gonna say we stuck. We have what we have for the moment and it's changing and it's progressing in a very different manner in the pace that it needs to for right now. But I got to go. I got um, I have to train some clients real soon. I got to get ragged in that head space. But we're gonna have to do a part two of this or something because this is this was dope. This is real dope. But um, we're going to end with our affirmations like we normally do for all of the new faces I'm seeing in here. I say an affirmation on my end. You say the same thing on your end out loud and hopefully it takes over for your day depending on how much you believe or like you know whatever you whatever's meant for you for today i hope that it touches you in some type of way and we get it moving forward so the first one i am ready to learn i am ready to receive i am ready to heal i am ready to believe i am open to progression I am open to advancement. I receive resources. I receive help. And I receive abundance. I love y'all. I'll catch y'all later. I wish we could we had more time, but I have responsibilities. I love y'all. Peace and chicken grease.